Hello and welcome to 365 Days Towards Racial Change. My name is Thomas Nyback. We're here talking about black issues in America, wondering if blacks, especially those descended from slaves, still are still marginalized, disenfranchised uh, from America's uh, great stores of wealth, resources, primarily. You know, we, we, in this forum, we kind of steer away from the moral issues, right and wrong, you know, everybody's flip-flops on that. Uh, but when it comes to the movement of the mighty dollar, uh, access to wealth and resources, I think then we can get us some hard data uh, to demonstrate what's really going on, you know, because people can say something to your face, but live another way or be in the closet about other issues. Uh, so that's kind of, you know, we talk about the issues, uh, slavery, the history, past, present, possible futures, uh, and a lot of moral circumstances come up, but we also, those things have no, I mean, we can't attach much to them until we can put some tangible um, components to that. And the most tangible, visible one is the almighty dollar in America. You know, the person who's got a most, how did they get it? What, what, what circumstances make that? Why are um, uh, most of the people in this group, a group that's already a minority, uh, you know, why is the minority, why is the majority of the minority suffering so much, <laughs> having pressures from within and without? So that, that's kind of what goes on. Two thoughts emerge as I continue on with this uh, project. First thought has two parts. First part is this, is this black mind. Oh, of a, a level of ignorance, how things works, uh, processes, you know, uh, you know, caring about black issues in a real way and doing more to demonstrate <laughs> what is real, what, what needs to be done to bring all blacks into the fold and blacks who, who are more than entertainers and your pop stars and your game shows and all that. What about the black thinker? What about the, uh, you know, uh, any uh, kind of um, black expression in the world? You know, how can they be heard, taken seriously, uh, garner uh, the same um, attention, interest, and financial security uh, as uh, some of our big fireworks out there, uh, game show hosts, talk show hosts, uh, sports people. It's like, come on, man. You know, there's um, blacks got to participate in where we can do more than that, I'm sure. And the second part of that first thought is that the white mind. We're talking about the guys, mindsets, uh, especially blacks and whites and everybody in between, but focusing on blacks and whites. For whites, do they uh, pass on uh, expectation of privilege, their entitlement? Is that just a growing thing among them? Um, the apparent lack of dysfunction. Whites have plenty of dysfunction. Too. Just found a guy, I guess, uh, Virginia, <laughs> murdering up all kinds of people uh, in his community. Uh, so, you know, it, every, everybody's, everybody's has a share of what we might consider right and what we consider wrong, okay? But I'm talking about the white idea, white thought, you know, um, are whites more prone to educate one another to oh to keep keep their their community 
in a, in a certain way. You know, I look at the guys at work, where I work, I work a blue collar job. Uh, it's a uh, logistics company, a lot of heavy stuff and all that. But, you know, you know those, those white guys are just, it's, it's, it's a good old boy. It's very light there, you know, and uh, <laughs> I've made my forays trying to breach uh, that community and environment. Can't find anything to explicitly claim racism. But, but race plays a part. So uh, bottom line is, is the white idea of uh, perpetuating their community, their community's success, domination, you know, is that a real thing? Getting passed along from generation to generation. They, they teach in their children. The black community is, in my circle, I can speak from my experience, my community was not an educational community, <laughs> you know. Uh, we, we watched, all we could do was watch and make up the story in our own minds as we go. You know, I think that's a big problem with the black community. They don't, they don't holler back. Not enough of that going on. I think, you know, we can complain about white success, but is there a... Uh, do they have a philosophy with one another? I, I'll tell you a quick story. I was in, uh, I think I've told this before, days ago, I'm sure, about when I was in a mission, you know, and uh, I'm going to help mission work. It's a long story of how people interact, but you just, you participate to earn your key. And so I'm participating, and, you know, and it's, everybody's there, black, white, Hispanic, you know, Asians coming through. But, uh, you know, I'm there, I'm doing, I'm participating. And a lot of outside people come to uh, volunteer, you know, doing stuff, service work and stuff like that. So, and some of them are regulars. And so, but, you know, a new white guy came in to participate, same kind of level as I am in a position in, in this mission community and one of the volunteers is paying very close attention to this new white guy man they never said a word to me about how even how i was doing yeah you know, i don't even think i ever traded greetings morning greetings with this man uh but the new white dude came in and he was encouraging him with scriptures and encouragement stuff like that. You know, I let it go. You know, I hadn't even gotten into this material yet, but I mean, that, that, that's a sense of what uh, what I had already observed in American society. I've been, I've been around for a few decades. And that's what I'm talking about. Right? I don't go for, you know, black folks, if I'm in, in, in turn that around, I've been in situations where I was the new guy, but, you know, I was encouraged in uh, dysfunction by elderly black man, black men. I was, you know, encouraged to complain and bitch about stuff. <laughs> you know, you see the difference? Uh, some people know what I'm talking about, some people don't. I'm not going to go into it. It's like trying to explain a joke. It loses its power the more you dissect it. Now, the second thought is for financial literacy. Uh, here's another aspect, though. You know, white folks, boy, they can speak a financial language. Investments, um, mortgage, you know, they, they have access. Uh, I, I do some yard work for a lady to get uh, uh, get some liquid. I, my money's as finally stabilized, at least in my mentality and my, my wallet, and uh, so I'm starting to ah, starting to understand what that comes from a language, you know. So anyway, this white lady I work for uh, occasionally, you know, she she gives me a few bucks. We have to make an agreement, but it's like what um, she's buying a house, she's moving, 
And boy, they can talk about interest rates, mortgage rates, demographics of an area. Ain't no black folk ever talked to me about that, right? So, but you know, I'm I I'm had to take it on myself was was probably the clue anyway. But to get my own financial literacy, to get, find my own financial resources and stuff like that, and that's sad about the black community. There's not enough. I mean, when when we're sitting around in a group, do we are we on the same page? Uh come on. And uh, so the black community, they get very low marks when it comes to uh, financial literacy for one and passing on uh, financial literacy. You know, we don't. In my experience, we don't generally have it, number one. And number two, since the black community is very hesitant to be transparent about itself and these things, it's like we, we want to, it seems like we want to walk around thinking we know when we, we are just as ignorant as a stone. I know, I know that was my experience. So financial literacy, any literacy uh, gives us access uh, to higher echelons of any discipline. You know, I have a, I have a driver's license. I know the etiquette of driving in the road. I, I can drive uh, big commercial vehicles as well. There's a, some language that goes into that. You know, not just training, but there's a way to interact. You know, language isn't, isn't just out of the voice. Literacy isn't just reading a book, it is, it's also engaging with the outside world. You know, if I have no, if I have no financial literacy, I cannot engage with a financial world. It's just that simple. I'm at the mercy of that world, actually. Spending my dollars, paying a high, incredible amounts of taxes, without understanding, being mad that the Elite pay so little in taxes. Well, the elite provide house or uh, provide jobs, and sometimes housing. Uh, they provide equipment, space, and they do the bookkeeping. They get a break. They get a break. That's how it works in America. Okay, so see now, now that I'm, I'm it, I, I think it's still messed up. <laughs> but now that I've gotten my financial literacy, I at least understand one thing about me, folks. I can deal with any situation that I understand, even if it, even if I'm at uh, even if I'm vulnerable or at risk. If I understand it, uh, I, I can I can generally deal with it. I'm like that. Okay, let's get on with it. I'm inspired by a man named Dr. Claude Anderson. Please get these books. Oh, Black History Reader, 101 Questions You Never Thought to Ask, Black Labor, White Wealth, Search for Power and Economic Justice and Dr. Anderson's National Plan to Empower Black America, Poweronomics. You can find Dr. Anderson at poweronomics.com and the Heritage Institute in Washington, D.C. Behind me, you see the uh, hashtag us too. You'll find many black women there supporting one another, having their discourse. Check out Black Enough, B-L-A-G-G-E-N-U-F, kind of a black Facebook. We also have story time here, Uncle Tom's Cabin. Please read this book and read it from beginning to end. I'm at the end, and I couldn't even much finish the end. I, I won't be a, a spoiler for you, but read the book to the end. It's very important. It's not some little short pamphlet like I thought it was. And so I, I know some of my uh, some of the subscribers think it's a little pamphlet. It's, it's a pretty it's a pretty long book. You know, it's got some some reading to do in that, so uh, be prepared, but read it to the end. I just encourage you to read it to the end. We are, uh, oh, and also, if you found me here on uh, YouTube, you are informationally illiterate. I mean, you are informationally literate and uh, technologically literate. You can find your flavor. Go find your community. I encourage you to do that uh, with the internet. Wrapping up our signers of the Declaration of Independence, just want to use the rest of the time to go over 
Oh, some of the highlights we've stumbled upon. You know, uh, my original intent was to look for a relationship between the religion of these men and their attitude towards slavery. Not much there. We didn't, because I, I used Wikipedia, I didn't do the in-depth thing about their biographies. Uh, as you may imagine, religion back then was just more a part of life. You know, it wasn't uh, biblical texts were the textbooks of, of many. Um, it's how you learned. So it was, you know, religion and schools were uh, commingled there. So um, you know, many people uh, knew their Bible back then. So everybody was kind of on the same page, you know, especially white folks anyway, European white folks and all that. Uh, it was in Hispanic, and Spanish, French, you know, Italians. You know, they all had an idea the Bible and stuff, and, you know, once it finally, once the Bible itself was emancipated uh, from, from Latin rule and made available to the masses, everybody kind of got on the same page with God, and, we, and they fought, and churches split and stuff like that. It's just, we're talking natural human behavior there. But anyway, a lot of these guys, their fathers were ministers, they were ministers, and stuff like that. So they're all coded closely related to religion. Uh, only a few of them, I could say, kind of mentions their religion in context with uh, the slave issue. Now, I, I found, you know, uh, seven were confirmed abolitionists. Three more were what I call emancipators. They, it's uh, documented that they either willed freedom for their slaves or they emancipated their one or two slaves that they uh, may have had. Uh, so not the religion and slavery didn't happen, but we've, we stumbled onto some other interesting tidbits about uh, the uh, uh, signers of the Declaration of Independence, these guys, these white men that were framers, a kind of good old boys club we find student and teacher in the same 56 uh, men presented. Uh, in some cases, Thomas Jefferson was a student of, uh, I forget who, uh, possibly, possibly our last guy, George White. Um, but so, you know, so these guys were older and educators and stuff like that. Other guys were new and just getting their feet wet in politics. Okay. Uh, think of America as a business concept. One thing you can come away with is uh, uh, mercantilism, uh, you know, slave institution and all that, uh, seafaring trades, uh, very prominent in the lives of all these men. That, you know, the colonies were mo mostly an East Coast uh, phenomenon at the time. We didn't start spilling out West till, till uh, later on. And, um, you know, uh, for the upcoming war, well, back to the business concept, uh, we need to, I, I think we need to pay more attention to that. Like, if you look at corporate uh, like bylaws, how they're structured, created, uh, how they become uh, viable as uh, tax entities, where they fall in taxation. It's, it's a lot of the language used in creating corporations as we find in creating the nation, the Declaration of Independence, you know, you know forwarding a, a, an announcement of uh, the creation of this um, entity, entity, very important word, articles of confederation, things like that, same language that you use to start a corporation. So if, if we can get to understanding America as a business, some of, some of our uh, problems can be uh, uh, taken care of, thought out, thought through, okay? Now, for some of the guys, we had a guy, he financed the Navy for the uh, revolution, a doctor believing 
that the black skin was a kind of leprosy, you know, that we were real white underneath. I would say we're all the same underneath. Skin color, though, is a different thing. And although, you know, the, the melanin is an issue, you know, but melanin is not a cancer <laughs> on uh, black people. Oh, the framers influencing the minds, you know, the minds. Um, vast majority abstained from the issue. A lot of these guys were just so immersed in their businesses. I'm talking slave owners and uh, the politicians alike. You'll see their resume in and out of office and handling and you know, working on stuff. Um, now, I do think it's a problem, you know, the framers are going to say they lack representation uh, over in England, but that's also a problem here. You know, I mean, does the is the farmer just receiving word on the new law, or or did they really participate in making their voice heard and having that view sent to the central government? I think it's very problematic. I can think. I think I can speak authoritatively on that because that's how I feel. You know, your one vote counts. I don't know, man. You know, the last election supposedly one person got the popular vote, but then we have this uh, entity called the Electoral College uh, that can make up its own mind. You know that. You know, our the popular vote is more a suggestion. <laughs> you know, it's like taking the temperature and we'll proceed, you know, the electoral college is going to proceed on some other issues. Very interesting, very interesting. Um, you know, so with that, you know, that's some of the, you know, as the, the, the nation began, this is the 17, you know, a late the third quarter of the 1700s and um, uh, needs need to be addressed policy needs to be created do we still want to be under uh, someone else's role uh, you know right now in my life I'm going through a similar thing I've got a two-year kind of uh, respite from about three decades of being tossed here and there, addicted to drugs, and you know, being told what to do, having my life managed, understanding the ignorance of uh, the people looking after me, and stuff like going through all that, and finally a two-year <clears throat> uh, buffer, and now I am uh, going to finish my degree and all that. I say that to say, you know, the, these. Uh, the people for separation from England got the idea, I think rightly so, you know, you don't want people, uh, you, you, um, somewhere else that don't know your situation telling you what to do. I, I ran into that a lot. Uh, so did the framers, you know, I'm just a small microcosm of what the framers and the signers were feeling and going through, you know, they, they they were in a different space, a long way away, had different needs, and that was how um, they needed to proceed. They needed to separate, sever from uh, what was going on. Now, uh, having said that, I want to just finish these last few minutes. You know, I'm concerned about black folks. I don't think black folks, well, in general, feel embattled, disenfranchised. You know, there's no, there's no urgency among us for change. And that's sad. I, I feel like we had all this fanfare, this air and pomp and impotence of the 60s, that was a failure. Remember that that's a was a failure for us. Uh, we we didn't get what we needed. We're seeing other groups 
getting money, resources, land, favor and immigration. You know, the, the, the southern border is inundated and it's overflowing now. But, uh, you know, the people who do make it legally, they're maybe going to find a good way to go here in America as they step over uh, black lives. <laughs> Uh, you know, well, we just had the NAACP Image Awards, great gown, time, people dressed up, red carpets, and all this. And, you know, I don't see any difference between that and what white folks do. You know, black folks are always copying white, white folks, always coming behind. And we wonder why we're at this level, you know, because so many have gone before us. We need to make a new, a whole brand new way for the world to begin to respect and recognize us. Very simple. And, you know, as you know, we, we have this big gala. We have a comedian host. And it, it's it's, I don't see the difference between what we're doing and what white folks are doing, and why we. I, and I, I, it makes me understand why we are at a ceiling. You know what I mean? I hope you know what I mean on that. I hope I don't have to di dissect that one for you. You know, um, I, I drive trucks well, and I can drive well, and I can crisscross the country. White folks did that long before. I did come along. They trained me how to do their work. Think about it. You know, black folks, <laughs> we got so many <laughs> comedians, and it's nothing but entertainment. Like, where's where's the serious black folks? There's a, unfortunately, there's a few guys cropping up on CNN. Uh, Don Lemon and the guy working with the incarceration issue and some other guys. Now, now there, that's some substantive stuff going on, you know, but you know, you don't see, you know, it's not a big outpouring of black support for that, you know. Black people behaving poorly that need to behave rightly. Young gentleman from the uh, NFL, uh, NFL draft, drafted to the Giants. You know, great start in the NFL. The Giants are going to have another run. Every every team has its cycle. You know, <laughs> and the brothers out just at a party. You know, up there in the hood, and he gets shot. He's he lived. I think his friend died or something. You know, bad bad stuff. Like dude. Dude, why, why are black people like that? With so much going on, you know, I'm tying this into the foundation and the creation of the nation, you know, but we need to keep some of that in the front of our mind, you know. Uh, it needs to be a kind of a firebrand to our soul and consciousnesses uh, to motivate us. To, to come together, keep it together, not begrudgingly and with all okay, these attitudes that we can find when black people congregate, <laughs> we can do better. You know, it, uh, it makes me wonder what I'm doing, you know, because you look at the NAACP Image Awards packed hall of well-dressed Black folks, where is where is the uh, disenfranchisement? Where is the marginalization? It's definitely not apparent when you look at those kind of events. Uh, already, uh, those events that are already um, what's the word I'm looking for? Like. Uh, piloted by white folks, a nice big event with a comedian there to, 
and we laugh and stuff. And we're like, ah, man, come on, man. We, we, it's like we've arrived at something when we, we have not, you know. Hopefully there's some rhetoric, rhetoric in the wind about the issue with incarceration and some stuff. I hope that these uh, issues gain momentum and we see a turning. You know, but one one issue that's going to have to be made evident and clear is that Black folks need to start behaving rightly. We need to take our history and um, celebrate the survival, but understand that we are still underneath, especially financially, economically, we are too, still too far underneath um, what's going on in mainstream America. Too far underneath, and we got to work on that. That's my little spiel for today. We're going to get, I just want to have a wrap up of that, tie it in with what's happening with blacks today. And we'll get into some of the normal material now uh, that we talked about some of the beginning events of this nation. I'm Tomlin's Nyback. Thanks for hanging out with me on day 120.